Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's webinar. It's a pleasure to have all of you joining us from different parts of the world. And of course, it is our pleasure to have Christian Log, who is the former head of operations and central services at Liverpool FC. In just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Christian, but there's a couple of items that I want to run through before we continue. And the first one is I'd want to make sure that the sound is coming through on your end. So what I would ask you to do is to type in the chat box, OK. And I would also ask you to type in the city or the country where you're connecting from, because we always like to know where our audience is coming from. So go ahead and type in the chat box now and put where you're connecting from, and that'll tell us that the sound is working on your end. So Carlos says, OK, we have Oviedo, Spain. Great. Porto Alegre, right. New Zealand, Dunedin, Barcelona, Lisbon, Athens, right. Catalonia, Canada. Um, excellent. Dominican Republic, Miami. Wow, fantastic. This is the great thing about this type of webinars that we can connect with everybody from all over the world. So welcome. I'm glad to hear that the sound is coming through properly. So my name, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Diego Valdez and I am the director at the Sports Business Institute Barcelona. And what we do is we specialize in providing training for those that are looking to start, advance and develop their career in the business side of football. And in fact, tonight is an example of the type of uh, online masterclass that we have in our Certificate in Football Business Management program, which runs every year from October to June. So this is an opportunity um, for you to see the type of learnings, the type of material that we have and that we provide to the people that come through our virtual doors. Um, tonight, of course, we have the pleasure of having Christian Long, and he's going to talk about how Liverpool FC delivered excellence off the pitch. And uh, it's a very interesting presentation. I've had a chance to talk it over with Christian, and I'm sure that you're going to find a lot of value. Now, the way it's, we're going to structure it is I'm going to turn it over to Christian for his presentation in just a moment. After his presentation, there will be a, a moment for Q and A's. So you can type in your questions in the chat box. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit more about the program that I mentioned at the outset, our certificate in football business management. So you have an opportunity to learn more about it and understand how we deliver the program. So without further delay, I'm uh, going to hand it over to Christian now. And uh, Christian, if you can hear me, um, go ahead and let us know and we can uh, we can begin with your presentation. I'll load it on screen. I'm ready. I can hear you, Diego. I'm ready to go. <clears throat> Excellent. Over to you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, it is a pleasure actually to talk to all of you from all over the world this evening and just give you a bit of a flavor of um, um, sort of some, some of my background and also some of the flavor of the things that we, we've done at Liverpool over the last couple of years. Hopefully you'll find it of interest. Uh, uh, I'll sort of kick off with, if you like, with um, uh, my background. And um, my background, you may wonder, well, how, how have you ended up in, in, in football? I originally, my, my sort of uh, degrees were, were doing pharmacy and law. I'm still a qualified pharmacist. Uh, I'd probably kill someone now if I worked in a pharmacy. But technically, I'm still on the register here within the UK and can, uh, and, and can be a pharmacist. But sort of building up to the, the role that I, I've had most recently, which was head of operations and central service at Liverpool, um, my background is very much around operations, business development and transformation. Uh, and I've worked within uh, health, within retail and obviously sports as well. So just give, give you a bit of flavour, some of the roles that you see up on the screen there, really. The head of business development role when I was at Lloyd's Pharmacy was really looking at how uh, to, to move into new markets uh, for Lloyd's Pharmacy, um, other than this sort of uh, core community pharmacy market that they were within. I then went to uh, join an organization called the Operation, uh, the Expert Patients Program. And I was operations director there. And that was used to be part of the NHS here in the UK. And uh, I was recruited to actually sort of privatize it, if you like, out of the NHS 
and make it a self you know, sustainable organization. And that's I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, they are still going today under a different name, but um, they're still a sustainable organization. And I went back into pharmacy and, and sort of wider business um, with the co-op pharmacy. Uh, I was head of transformation and development for them. And co-op in the UK are a big organization. They, they not only have pharmacy businesses, but they have food businesses, they have funeral care businesses, and they have a whole range of businesses. And that was an opportunity for me. While I was based within one, one business, I did work across the group. Um, I had a lot of experience in that, um, of many different businesses. Uh, and some of you may be aware of some of the challenges that were faced by co-op here in the UK. Um, they had to sell some of their businesses. One of those businesses was the pharmacy business. Uh, and I, I was uh, um, involved and, and led the, the sale of the, the pharmacy business. Uh, two new owners back in 2014, um, and that company was was named Well, uh, where I, I went with that company and became a uh, director there as portfolio and business development director. Um, that was a very interesting time of selling a business, going with it, and then rebranding it, coming up with a new name, how you rebrand 800 stores across the UK, to set up new regional offices, how you sort of expand the business, sort of take it forward in terms of acquisitions. Um, and then that leads me to Liverpool, really, in terms of uh, uh, being approached by Liverpool, uh, a Premier League football club, didn't know which one it was, but coming and joining them to do um, to do this particular role that I've done over the last two years, which was head of operations and central services, and look at what are things we can do to actually deliver excellence, but also um, sort of bring together some of the things and kick the club on and the business side of it. And that's why I've termed this presentation about how you deliver excellence off the pitch, because um, undoubtedly uh, no one can argue that Liverpool definitely deliver excellence on the pitch in terms of their performances this year, in terms of getting to the Champions League final and finishing in the top four as well. And then just to sort of share some some information with you as well, I'm I'm currently completed my first year of the Masters in Sporting Directorship. Um, I think some of my colleagues are on this webinar this evening, so welcome to them. Uh, and I also, with uh, the Sports Business in Barcelona, uh, this year uh, did um, a, a four-month program on managing digital transformation within sports. Uh, and I'm more than happy to talk to people about them if they want to get any information on them. Um, obviously, you can get you can contact me through LinkedIn. So, moving on, what, what I thought I'd just set really is what, what are you trying to do within a football club? And this is just my own interpretation of it. Um, aside from winning trophies and winning matches, the key things you know that I I think you're trying to do within any sort of football club is protecting, growing the revenue, the profit, the fan base, the brand reputation and promise. Then looking at how you can improve the efficiency and standards around how you manage your third party suppliers and contracts you've got, of which there's many across football club, a lot more than you actually um, um, potentially appreciate uh, at first thought. How you actually manage the capacity. And I'm going to come on to that because um, that was one of um, the the nice surprises of joining Liverpool is around, you know, the, how many projects there are going on within the club and how very, very they, those things are. And how you drive that excellence to systems and processes. And and what are the opportunities to innovate and diversify? So how can you look at, you know, improved digital channels, new technologies, and also what new markets? Uh, and new markets, what I mean by that is around new markets across the world. Liverpool is an international brand. Uh, it, it will try and drive into uh, different markets across the world, and so that's very much, you know, something around that. And then transforming uh, fan loyalty into advocacy, uh, how you can improve the ways of working, how to manage change more effectively, and also how to not necessarily transform the, cult the internal culture, but just move the dial on it to actually get it become more effective um, than, it, than it's potentially been in, in, in recent times, because the organisation grew from 300 people to 800 people. Um, in a very short space of time, uh, so it's about how you gel that 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 sort of organisation together. Even though it's quite small, it's grown quite rapidly. Um, but the beauty you have with a football club, I think, really, is very much around how you actually um, everybody's there because they want to be there. It's quite a different dynamic um, to perhaps maybe you know working in a in a certain retail environment or even in the health environment. From my experience, and how about doing that? How do you do that? It's very much around. You know, amplifying Anfield. Anfield is world renowned. Uh, it's something that everybody recognises and attaches with Liverpool, apart from obviously the many players that have passed through the doors of Anfield over the last you know, 50, 60 years and beyond. And then underpinned by that really is the club values, which are ambition, unity, commitment and dignity, which is something that is 
um, ever present really within the club. Um, not only within the sort of the, it's, it's an all elements of the club, really. You see it through throughout um, the footballing side as well. So, what what's, what what is that vision for delivering excellence? For me, it's about focusing on six key areas. These areas here of actually how you look at building a world class environment across the club, the efficiency and profit protection elements, how you can actually manage change and capacity planning better. How you look at the risk uh, across the club, uh, which is something I'll talk about as well, and how you actually deliver fan experience and service delivery uh, as effectively as you can, and so such a way you actually are delighting all the fans. Um, uh, and that is quite a difficult dynamic within within a football club sometimes because it all hinges a lot with what's happening on the pitch. But I'll talk about some of the things that. You know, particularly at Anfield, because uh, this is a massive topic fan experience. I'll talk about things at Anfield that we did to actually sort of drive that forward and sort of take that forward. And then the last one, obviously, is the people. Uh, and that's probably the most fundamental thing uh, that runs throughout the whole presentation. When you hear me talk about uh, cross functional, about getting buy in, because that's key. Because um, for me, excellence, uh, it's not a skill, it's an attitude. And that's something that. Uh, uh, if, if you if, if you focus on that, um, that is actually you know a key thing to drive things forward as well in terms of the people and giving in the right environment to, to be able to deliver excellence. So let's start with world class environment. So uh, go back to April 2016 when I arrived, just to set a bit of context for you when I uh, when I arrived. So we're coming up to uh, the end of that season. The new main stand at Anfield, uh, not many of you have been there, uh, was virtually complete. So the build was complete, but there was a lot of other elements that needed to be com to complete around um, um, getting things ready for the new season, which was going to be our first game against Leicester for the following seasons in September. And to give you an aspect of some of the environments, obviously, bottom left is the new main stand. Uh, brand spanking new a couple of years ago. Uh, it is an odd to, be, to behold. I, I genuinely mean that for those that have been at Anfield or haven't been at Anfield, you should you should try and get there, even from walking down. Walton Breck Road towards Anfield. It's a it's a great site, and also in terms of the actual experience that fans have within that stadium in particular, but also the whole uh, atmosphere around Anfield prior to match, during the match, and also post match as well. The top left hand picture is the boardroom. Now that's the sort of most prestigious area uh, within Anfield in terms of our hospitality offering, and then the one to top right is the executive lounge, which is the tier below that. But still, uh, I can say I've, I've, I've dined in both of them. They're both, they're both very pleasing experiences and very enjoyable. And then bottom right hand, I just see that sort of aerial picture of the new main stand connected with all the other stands around Anfield. Now, obviously, talking about environments, uh, when I arrived two years ago as well, uh, obviously Melwood, I arrived at, as, you, as you would be, you'd be impressed by walking into Melwood. But I would say over the last two years, both at the academy in Melwood, there's been a step change in lifting the standards at both these locations uh, to actually sort of say oh, these are worthy of being Liverpool uh, FC premises, really, and actually environments that actually we want to sort of uh, create for the players and create for um, attracting players as well, particularly at the academy in terms of attraction and retention. Um, slightly different dynamic, obviously, for the first team, but. Um, I can assure you that both the, both these environments are top-notch facilities and uh, have had a step change. The top left and the bottom right pictures that you see, uh, some of you may have seen these in the press. These are pictures of the new first team and under-23s training facility that's being built at uh, where the academy currently is, out in Kirby in Merseyside. Um, and that's going to be built in 2019. Uh, with the first team moving in and then the 23s moving down from the academy into that building as well, uh, which will actually be a, it's a really important thing for, uh, for, for us to do that, really, because all the, you know, all the top six teams have that sort of dynamic where the, the academy and the first team are actually joined all together on the one site. Um, and there's a huge aspirational thing for young players to actually look down to, you know, down their pitches to actually say, actually, that's where I'm aiming to get to. Um, I was fortunate enough to be involved in you know, the design of that building and how um, that building will actually operate once it's, up, once it's opening. And um, there's been a lot of work going into that. 
The other thing, obviously, to talk about to touch on main stand expansion. You know, when I arrived in April 16, it was it was virtually built, but there was um, one of the things I was sort of tasked with doing was actually saying, okay, how do we make sure we get everything sorted, not only for the beginning of the season, but for works that we're going to be continuing on after that, like the players' area under the stadium wasn't finished by the time we started the first game. It was also making sure that we had all the things in place for getting the safety certificate so we could actually open the stadium and uh, getting the experience right for fans around that stadium, making sure we could drive all the revenue opportunities from the new main stand and also the comms and marketing elements of that as well. Uh, so that was a thing that I was tasked with coming together and pulling together that critical success plan of how we did that. Um, and that went on not only to the first, the first game of the season against Leicester, but also throughout the sort of the next 18 months as well. To actually say, okay, how, how do we sort of make this as um, effective, as efficient, and as great an experience for fans as possible? Uh, and just to talk about the pictures below, we also gave fans the opportunity to buy a block uh, which went down outside the stadium that they could put their own inscription on it. Um, so that was that was done at, at the beginning of um, when the stand opened. But we've also this year put another there's another phase going in uh, for fans to be able to do that as well. Um, and, uh, a quick comment on the on the black benches that you can see there, really. Those are benches that are put outside the stadium, which highlighted the key players from Liverpool's history. Uh, some of our fans christened them. They look more like coffins uh, than anything else. So um, that was something that uh, was uh, written by some of the fans. But five focus areas for world-class facilities um, and, and environments really is around making sure you've got the right systems and process in place to make sure you can optimise the usage and reduce the operational costs of, of the facilities. If you can imagine, some of these facilities are, are being run a lot of hours, and you have to think about how, how effective you can be around um, saving energy bills and stuff like that. The element of it as well around collaboration communication, that's absolutely key as well, because whatever the environments are, you're going to have different teams interacting across a stadium, whether it's hospitality, stewarding, external cleaning companies, external security companies. At the end of the day, it's one team, and the public and the fans see them as Liverpool. They don't see them as separate. So that was something that we worked very um, heavily on around, again, making sure that teams worked as one team within within, any state, within envir environments and uh, worked together to make sure we delivered the best service as, as we, that we could. And again, you know, I was always amazed when, you know, when I arrived. You don't realise how much it takes to get 22 guys on a, on a football pitch, but the amount of capital projects that we plan for every summer to get done and that's that's an ongoing thing within a football club because you've got a very short window to get those things achieved so i mentioned about you know new main stand being built but there was further building going on you know within the stadium even during the season the anfield retail store the new store uh, opened at anfield last summer um and over the last number of years we've done training ground the first team training ground at Melwood and academy upgrades we've put a new educational space because obviously the children at the academy uh, they take lessons there as well and um, also the development of the new training ground, which is also going to be out in Kirby and Merseyside as well, uh, joined to the, the academy. Uh, that's 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 some of them. But there's other things that we've done in terms of you know that I've been involved in led around the um, uh, the, the retail stores. We've done fit outs to the retail stores, and we've also done fit outs in our head office, um, the head office where the majority of the staff sit within Liverpool, um, which is in. Um, in Liverpool uh, city centre itself, so we were three three floors on a on a building in Liverpool. So there's been fit outs done in all of those. Now optimising the facilities and how you manage them really again that's all around policies and procedures and making sure you've got an effective operation. Looking at how you can reduce the carbon footprint uh, and that tied in with the red going green strategy that I uh, relaunched over the last two years, which is the energy and environment strategy within the club and putting in systems and making sure that once you've got the systems in, they're actually commissioned and working properly. So putting in a, um, a building management system, putting in CAPM system and, and visitor management systems, those are all quite key components. And then the whole security measures, you know, the world's a very different place three years ago to where we are today. Um, and we've seen the type of things that can happen around stadiums. Um, so very much, yeah, I'm going to touch a bit more on that later on, but very much a case of uh, how, what things can you do to actually drive that forward. And the last two areas are around the IT infrastructure. Uh, so one of the things I've, I've mentioned there about the DAS system, and that's something we put in Anfield, because um, it was one of the biggest complaints that we had with fans was not being able to get on there, um, get on Wi-Fi um, within the stadium. 
And it was frustrating because they actually see that you could be on Wi-Fi, but the system that we had in didn't actually create the right capacity. So we invested a lot of money in a very complex project and putting that in place. And that was a key thing because that was probably one of the top two things that fans complained about regarding um, Anfield was that, and obviously solving that was a key thing. And that's not not every stadium has that, so you know that's that's a, a positive thing that we put in place. And then the infrastructure as well to actually make sure we've got the right IT infrastructure for marketing and digital strategies around the environments uh, is quite key as well. Uh, particularly when our commercial team are going out to try and sell those. Um, uh, opportunities to prospective partners that we that we have, we need to make sure, we need to make sure that that was actually spot on as well, and actually enabling our staff because our staff are split across different sites. If you think about the likes of the head office area within Liverpool, the Anfield itself, there's staff there, there's staff at Ch there's staff at uh, the academy, there's staff at uh, Melwood, there's staff at the distribution centre. Having more agile, uh, having proper meeting space and more functionality around. You know, putting in place Office 365 for all staff, so we could actually sort of, you know, be putting in video conferencing facilities, all of those, and much to create a more agile, more productive working dynamic. And health and safety, um, that's another area that I sort of focus a bit of my attention on around um, making sure that we had a, a, I feel like a new health and safety strategy to look at how we can actually sort of handle that more effectively, putting in the right systems, having the right policy. Looking at what what are we measuring that against, and we used um, the industry standard forty five thousand and one to be our benchmark. To say okay, this is what we're going to aim to sort of you know benchmarking ourselves against, and that's tied in with how we actually improved the governance around you know the committees that we had, the subcommittee meetings. So it was like everybody within the club had a had a role to play in an understanding of what their role was around health and safety. Second dynamic is efficiency and proper protection, and that's very much around the opportunities you can actually to to create sort of better ways of working. Uh, how can you optimise processes, governance, and business intelligence as well to actually sort of make the right decisions? I think everybody thinks about uh, efficiency. Uh, everybody thinks about cost savings is the first thing when people start talking about efficiency, but it's, it was much wider than that, and that was a key thing to try and you know for me to disseminate it across the whole club to say right, yes, cost saving is part of it. But it is about freeing up time for staff to actually focus on high value and activity and looking at what you know, information we've got to make the right decisions first time. And that would lead us to actually be able to drive revenue as well, make things easier for the people that we're trying to deliver that for fans uh, and uh, um, and players. And also actually you know, be good for the for you know, working partnership with our suppliers and also our partners as well. And the four areas that you know we had a lot of focus on was very much okay, how can we improve? You know, business information reporting, match day, because uh, it's such a you know a big element of of uh, you know it's, it's where the show happens, isn't it? The match day, non-match day, and process control and efficiency. And I have a talk about business information reporting just to give a couple of examples on that. So one of the things uh, I sort of instigated was looking at you know what are our top twenty areas by spend, and how can we actually look at sort of getting better value for money on that. And putting contracts in place because you know, there were elements that you know you need to have contracts in place. You can actually ensure that um, suppliers are actually performing at the level you want them to to give you the right level of service. Other elements was looking at how you streamline different processes. So one of them was around how we streamlined how we actually did our capital uh, request processes because uh, we do a lot of capital work. So streamlining all of that, making sure payments were done in the right way, it just helped us. Speed up a lot, uh, you know, with our with our suppliers, how we actually manage them and how we actually work with them. The other side of it as well was how we could improve visibility uh, and understanding really of management management information and management accounts for people that were in manager positions across the whole club, so they had the right information and they were actually tracking um, the costs that they could control and also the revenue lines as well uh, that they had real time you know, real time information to actually make sort of more informed decisions around that. And that led to actually having more uh, developed um, scorecards, uh, and we developed match day scorecards so we could track from the systems that we had um, when people were coming into the ground. And we used to set targets for you know an hour before the game, an hour and a half before the game, uh, up to sort of like kickoff. And also we used to look at you know we would look at average spend per head on a match. We'd be able to drill it down into different bars, different areas across the whole stadium, and that allowed us to actually sort of be able to drill down and understand why are certain 
areas working better than others, we could actually like, then analyze that further uh, and make improvements. Um, that was really key. And then ha having a monthly scorecard, which looked at you know cost, revenue, or fan experience measures, um, putting in place you know, how we looked at our, our fan service help desk worked internally, how the IT help desk would work, the maintenance help desk, so we could see how efficient we were actually dealing with these things whenever they arose. Because these those type of things, they burn time, they cause angst within an organization if they're not being dealt with um, quickly enough. And then also, you know, we could actually track effectively our health and safety incidents, security incidents, and also track um, a capital projects across the club. Because um, we put in, pla put in place a capital projects tracker so we could see where everything was, was in terms of something getting instigated to where it was in terms of its cost versus the budget, uh, and also in terms of timeline of when we were trying to get things completed by. And then match day, um, that was a case of looking at everything in terms of how could you make it more efficient. So we, you know, reviewing stewarding, security, cleaning, the resource for match day on a match day. At, at Anfield alone, you, you, we would have about 2,000 um, 2, additional workers that would come in and be covering our stewarding, to be covering our, our hospitality areas, to be covering fan support. So it's very much looking at how those teams could work more efficiently together and uh, understanding what we did in terms of their deployment. Review the cash office operation, um, looking at food wastage as well, which also tied in again with our, our Reds Going Green strategy. Um, and also how we looked at the ticketing operation uh, and also travel management on a match day. And what I mean by travel management was around how we could actually get fans to and from the ground more effectively as possible. Again, for those who have been at Anfield, you, you, you'll know it, but those that haven't, it's, it's bang in the centre of a residential area um, and managing uh, how our fans uh, respect the residents, uh, both coming to the ground and away from the ground, uh, is a can be a challenge um, in that type of environment. So that's something that uh, very heavily involved in with working with the city and working with you know our teams to make sure we could uh, and and obviously the representative of the, of the residents to make sure that was done as as, as swiftly and as um, pain free for them as possible. And then a non match day, um, some of you probably will have seen recently in the press that um, uh, with this, we've applied for An Anfield to be a uh, uh, Used for other sort of uh, opportunities other than football, so concerts and and, and different event, different locations like that. There are works happening this summer to enable that as well. Um, but again, that's looking at you know you know the staffing, security cleaning, how we can optimize the uses of the stadium uh, whenever it's actually open, and how, working very closely with you know our sales teams on that. In terms of they, they're obviously selling, they're selling the offer to actually people coming in and using the facilities when it's not a not not when it's a non match day but how do you make that operational and how to make those two things fit together there's a lot of work done to make that sort of slicker and make that operation slicker and then process control and efficiency um that's very much around you know looking at what are the different processes you've got and controls you've got to actually make sure you can drive those things forward and that's down to you know like experiential events that we have around the kit launch tourism friendlies and summer training camps that we have to so we can actually sort of make those as effective as possible and that was something else we created as well. I created a, a procurement function, which was a new thing at Liverpool. Um, but that grew from one on one individual to, to now three individuals, and uh, that that's really driven a lot of value in terms of actually sort of better contract management with our big contractors that we use for security, cleaning, pre-plan maintenance, uh, different things like that, logistics. But also how we can actually make cost savings across the club as well. And you know, we made annualized cost savings in the last two years with two and a half million pounds um, just from the function being in existence. Um, and that's really strengthened our ability to manage contractors as well and suppliers. And then these are just some examples, guys, of, of things that we've used to, to be, in terms of technology to help us in terms of um, putting in uh, the ability to actually to better enhance ticketing. So when people are buying tickets, they can see exactly what the picture of the pitch will be. And, and in particular in our hospitality areas, um, the, the ticket will go straight to their phones. Um, how we improved the website and obviously tied that in with our foundation as well. Um, the car parking around Anfield, we do have car parking. Uh, it was, if you can imagine, it was done in the past many years ago with people just handing cash in. So we moved it all digital. Uh, so it makes it much easier. It makes the whole operation slicker to get cars in. 
whenever other people are turning up. So it just makes everything slicker. And also in terms of it protects obviously the cash side of it as well. And then that technology enabled tour, and this was something that was uh, was uh, delivered, which was which was uh, a bit of a, bit, a big change, really, and a big positive step, really, in terms of making the tour, uh, changing the tour, if you like, from a tour when it was the old main stand to around Anfield to uh, you know people taking people around, showing them, and so this is much more technology enabled. Uh, people can walk around themselves. Uh, they still get some of the experience that are quite unique at Anfield, where you, you can have the photograph taken touching the you know Anfield the Anfield sign. Um, you never walk alone, gets played, all of those type of things. But this is something they have. You are in control of your own journey around Anfield, and you can have a much more sort of involved experience. So that's been a big plus. A change capacity, a change capacity planning to move on to the third area. Um, I think the big the thing I would say about this area is around. Um, there is a, there's a lot of projects that happen within a football club environment. Um, and that was one of the things that actually I was quite surprised at in terms of the number of different projects that were happening. And But I, I think um, it was evident that there was needed to be some strengthening of the series as well, very much around you know the governance of it and also making sure that things were kicked off in the right way. And that's not to say it was being done badly previously, just that there was areas that could be tightened up that actually to, to sort of, you know, to make it excellent, really, in terms of taking that forward. So it was very much a case of you know, put, putting a change board in place, having a change planning group. That change planning group was a group of senior managers that would get together. People would actually submit their projects through the change planning group where it would be discussed. They could come there and get advice on different things. Uh, and that change planning group really was the gatekeeper, if you like, to actually understand, okay, what what is this robust enough? And how much money are we spending on it? Where could we where could we be fitting it in if we wanted to fit it in? But it was also clear to be saying what what's our definition of a project? Get consistency on that. Be clear about how we're going to manage the governance, the timelines, milestone tracking, and getting buy-in from the senior leadership team. And to be fair, um, you know, it's like any group of people. Some people will resist it because you know they, they feel they can get things done quicker themselves. But in the main, most people found it was very uh, important to have this because it removes the fact of you know people that shout the loudest get their voice heard, get their project delivered, get their project done from terms of the resource. And uh, yeah, so that, that that was key. But I think the, the big part of this, really, I would say, is that you need you need that active control. And you know, I I I call it air traffic control in this dynamic, and it's something I've used in the past and in, in, in my previous experience around having that need to have the ability to stop activity if it's being launched if it's not been thought through well. It also helps drive development of ideas and activity we plan right first time, because it means that actually there will be a challenge on it if it's not, but also it makes sure there's a, there's a heightened opportunity to have discussions between uh, people that are actually going to have to deliver on the ground to make sure that actually it will be delivered and it, and it can be delivered. Also supports you know the teams you've got looking at how you, know, how you do the business analysis, how you actually apportion support to actually do project delivery, helps with the resource planning on that. And how we did it as well is we tiered the projects. So we have tier one projects were of a certain level and certain level of you know impact to the business. Those things would be look slightly different. Those were more important, if you like. We said these are the ones that we've got to deliver, and then the tier two ones are the ones that yes, if we've got capacity, we'll deliver these ones as well. So it was a good way of actually positioning that, and everybody seeing this, and it was quite visible to everybody. These are the tier one, tier two projects, uh, and obviously things happen throughout a year where you have to deal with things. But allow informed decisions to be made to actually sort of say, okay, if we're going to do this. We have to stop doing something else because it's very easy in these type of environments to be like magpies. You go after the shiny thing again and again and again. But this provided a bit of structure and made it happen. It just makes things work a lot more slicker. And then th this was something, obviously, you know, um, we sort of, you know, I, I sort of, you know, embedded really within the club around how how you, how you sort of manage change and you know. In terms of making sure you've got cross-functional buy-in, be clear with everyone what your, you know, what that vision is. If you're needing to have a coalition of people across a club, because everybody works in different functions to deliver something, communicate that. Uh, give people, you know, the responsibility to go on and do it, um, and and actually make sure you can embed and institutionalize the change once it's there. Because uh, I think a lot of the time there were things being projects being delivered, but then nobody would actually do any assessment of okay, at the beginning. You said you were going to do X, Y, and Z, and this is what this was going to deliver for us. There wasn't probably enough business analysis done around how you do that, 
but that was something that was introduced and strengthened you know, strengthened uh, significantly. And then on, on risk management, um, uh, this is very much looking at okay, what are all the what are all the risks you have across a football club, um, from you know facility risks to uh, commercial risks to risks around the, the players, uh, and understanding those, making sure that managers understand their responsibilities around that, identifying where you maybe need some specialist support to go and help you with things, and then educating supporting employees to how they can manage their risk better. And that's, you know, in an essence, that's really what, 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 you know, what, what I did really by, by putting in place um, uh, sort of risk and security strategy. And I'll, I'll touch on that. That was, that was sort of built on sort of six pillars. I'll, I'll, I'll just bounce through these quite quickly. But critical asset review and, and sort of looking at business impact and continuity planning was you know, our, our biggest asset, if you like, was Anfield. So looking at Anfield and saying, okay, what are all the risks we've got around that? And realistically, that's where we would have a, you know, our biggest risk on a match day is definitely at Anfield. Not only in terms of, you know, our, our, you know, our prized assets in terms of players being there, but also and their families, but also in terms of uh, uh, the, the the number of people, you know, fifty four thousand people, you know, coming to Anfield now with the expansion of the new main stand, it's a big responsibility to make sure that you're looking after those people and that you've got um, a good sort of. Uh, um, a good asset review done to make sure you've got all those protection measures in place. And as we know today, the very uh, we live in a dif difficult world um, in respect to the sort of what the threats can be. So that's something we work very closely with, obviously the police on and and and, and different um, uh, agencies to put that in place around Anfield. But it's also making sure you've got, you know, if anything happens any of our other sites, what would we do? Uh, so if if something happened at Melwood and a fire happened at Melwood, how would we deal with that? Um, and that second area of incident and crisis management is, a, is an extension of, of, of the first one, but it, it was created separately because it was so vital. Um, so that's that's in you know what are we going to do if we have an incident uh, where we have a lone shooter uh, at Anfield or we have um, uh, a vehicle-borne uh, uh, incident at Anfield or if the plane goes down with the first team flying on it, which also carries our executive team. Uh, so these are the things that you know we 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 have we're developing those plans, making sure that those are robust as possible. Uh, and then first team risk and security program. That's not only when we have the first team, uh, you know, I suppose playing football if you like, but also you know if you think about these young guys coming uh, over to England for the first time, not knowing the areas, um, and also making sure that you know they're coming with their families. So making sure that there's a you know, for the residences, as an example, you know, we made sure that there was appropriate security reviews done of the residents and security checks done on that, um, and a whole a whole sort of things around the first team really um, that that we do. Uh, obviously, not not so much I want to go into or I can go into really, but you can appreciate um, these are um, viable assets to a football club, um, and they're also human beings, and, and they need support and help. Uh, in respect of, of uh, uh, their own security and uh, when they're as a player, but also as a, as, a, as a young guy, you know, around the streets of Liverpool or in this country if they're coming to from somewhere else. And then the, the, the look at these two of these together, incident reporting and information service provision. Um, we, obviously, there's always been, you know, a coherent way of actually sort of tracking incidents that we've had across the club. Um, where it kind of you know, but but there was more of any tax sort of, We need to standardise this and make sure we capture them all in one place. So there's a lot of work around how to actually make sure that we have a standardised way of doing it, but also introducing near miss reporting as well, so we could identify trends and learn, take learnings from things that actually happen when there are near misses, and as well as actually obviously working with police and different agencies around uh, risk and security. You obviously need to think about what other specialist services you need to actually sort of help deliver. Your overall sort of security and risk program. So that was very much a review of you know who are we going to employ, partner with to actually make sure we've got the right level of service and the right sort of information to make the right decision. And that also links to social media monitoring as well, and um, because of the, absolutely you know the world we live in today. Um, I can give you an example of that. Um, last summer as well, uh, obviously we uh, the first team went to um, they played in Hong Kong, so we. Obviously, did a lot of work around uh, protecting their phones and their equipment before they left, just as the England team have done whenever they um, they went over to Russia, really. So, 
there's a lot of work done with that. Uh, and then the final one really is around the governance and assurance that you put around it. And, and I'll just click on to the next slide, which is, you know, putting in place a, put it in, up in place a risk board, which I sat on and chaired that risk board and with executive executive board members on that. So the likes of Peter Murr, our chief executive sat on that and our chief financial officer, Andy Hughes, and people like that are, are the main sort of board directors. And then that risk management group, the risk board would meet every quarter and a risk management group was a group of senior managers, which again, I chaired, which uh, was very much a case of getting that senior manager group together to review the risks that we had. Um, and that we met on a monthly basis to go through that, go through, you know, where we felt there was a need to sort of think about focusing in different areas. And that sort of bottom up, top down, side to side review of risk was really the way that we embedded it, you know, top to bottom within the club. I made sure that everybody understood their responsibility around risk. I did want to put this slide in because this is sometimes, you know, forgotten around risk and security, around information security. And this is to give you an, a, a slight insight into, you know, how we, how we sort of set our standard within the club. So we set our standard as, you know, again, international standard, um, having that strategic framework of how we actually looked at um, information security, um, looking at um, CPNI, um, the cyber essentials, having a, a defined repeatable method to actually assess ourselves against and to, to, to give ourselves consistency across the whole organisation and something to point to for the organisation to say, okay, this is the way that we're doing it and this is why we're doing it. Uh, and, you know, I think any of you have been involved in, in the trials and tribulations of uh, doing GDPR uh, over the last sort of uh, year. Uh, my uh, my woes are with you because I didn't, I was involved and I led, I led the, the, that, uh, uh, making sure that we were GDPR compliant. Um, and that said, that, has, that, was a, that was a challenge for us as I'm sure it was for other organisations, but please to say that's, that's been done. Um, and then fan experience and service delivery. Um, I've got two slides in this area here, but I, the first slide really is just talking about fan experience, and this is about Anfield really. Um, I, I, and I will bounce through this, but I, these are just markers for me, these different things that we did. So starting in the top left hand, which is the green card, really. So that was very much looking at, you know, how do we improve our ticketing services on a match day? Because people still do turn up on a match day to get their ticket. Uh, you know, for the people that are actually don't are not season ticket holders, because there's a lot of people that come to Anfield for the experience, it's a one-off experience for them, and we're very focused on that. Um, that. Actually, how do we sort of make sure they have the best experience when they're there? And one of the things that we did as well was said that the new main stand was um, fan zones, which is the next picture along, um, and obviously having having defined fan zones for different people was very important too. So we have a family zone, which, as you can imagine, has got lots of activities for the children. And uh, there's no alcohol served in that area. And there's another area where obviously alcohol will be served. And then again, people that have been to Anfield, there is um, um, 96 Avenue, which is the area out in front of the new main stand. And there's a lot of food area, food, uh, different type of foods that you can get out there. We put a big stage up. There's a band playing outside, um, and there's a lot of activity happens. Probably from the two, you know two hours before the game, all this activity is going on. That's about bringing people up to the stadium, you know, earlier and putting things on up at the stadium so they can enjoy the experience, but also to actually help that dynamic about people coming into the stadium to help, you know, as I was saying earlier, managing the, you know, the resident expectation about not having everybody sort of trample through their front lawns or what it may be with them at the volume of people that come. And food and drink offerings, I've mentioned about that. We had many different offerings that we put in place all around the stadium uh, and inside the stadium as well. We'd also have buskers inside the stadium as well. And playing inside, uh, picking the new main stand, the buskers playing as well. And the next one, the sort of blue picture, all the different people. That's that's accessibility. Um, so we we did a lot of work um, on making sure that disabled fans have, have a great experience at Anfield, um, to such a degree that um, we've been number one in terms of the experience for um, disabled fans at a Premier League football club for the last five years. Uh, moving quickly on to the picture with uh, Mighty Red in it in the top right hand corner. Mighty Red is the um, is the mascot of Liverpool. Uh, so we did a lot of work in terms of how, okay, how can how can we develop Mighty Red's exposure within local schools, but also on a match day, and how can we create experiences for people in, in, in regards to that. I've mentioned about what we did in the tours and we do tours in the match day as well up to a certain point. The next picture down which you can see those sort of yellow yell things on top of people's heads. That's our fan support team. So that was we have those people not only around Anfield on a match day, but they're down in the city centre, 
you know, helping people get up to the ground, showing them where they can get the, the you know, the bus from the city centre up to the ground. We have them down in the train stations, because obviously a lot of people travel in the train, to give people directions, give them information about Anfield, encourage people to come up to the ground early. The next picture is the Anfield store. Um, and that's been totally transformed from where it was before uh, in terms of a fan experience and, and just in terms of, you know, I would encourage people to go to the store and feel if you haven't been, uh, it's it's uh, it's very good. Um, and um, I mentioned the two things, obviously, you know, fans did talk to us about quite a lot was I mentioned about the, um, the gas system, about the Wi-Fi, but also was about leading Anfield. So there's a lot of work done around how can we improve the fan experience leading Anfield and getting to Anfield to such an extent. You know, we did lots of offers for people in terms of the using the bus services, and we worked with our partners that operate the bus service to actually make that more efficient. We did the same with the train services around, um, not only within the Liverpool area, but we, we um, went and lays with all of the train networks that cover the country that come to Liverpool matches. So dealing with Virgin. Um, and different companies like that. And the bottom right, the bottom left hand corner, we can see always on memory makers and complementary experts. They were the three themes of the training program that we have in place, we put in place actually to, to make sure that all of the people on a match day were actually, uh, were had the fan really at the heart of everything that they were doing. So that they were, you know, always on being, you're always thinking about, okay, how can you improve the experience? Memory makers, you think of those opportunities where you can actually make it special for someone and then complimentary experts. So it's quite natural that obviously people will approach people not and ask them a question, but it's not their core cool role. So we did a lot of work with those people to have, you know, to understand what are the things that are happening around Danfield. So we did briefings with them before. And obviously a lot of these people are from uh, their, um, uh, sort of casual people, relief people. So we did that through um, through emails and we did through webinars as well to give them information, just to make sure the experience at Anfield is the best. And and I would say, you know, I'm probably slightly biased on this because I've you know very heavily involved in, in delivering for, for the last two years. Uh, Anfield's been visit uh, visit football's top Premier League club in terms of the fan experience. On this piece, really, um, oh, I'm conscious of time here, but. Um, this is very much around making sure that our partners understand what we are about and understand what our expectations are. And to the extent that we did expect our security partners and our cleaning partners, people that are working at Anfield as partners of ours, to actually have their staff go through our program of how to have that great experience for people whenever they're there. Um, and also there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of um, things when we looked at time back to the procurement side, we needed to tighten up um, our, our, how we did tenders how we manage tenders and how we draw value out in that regard. And that's really what that slide's about, really. So I won't tell too much on that. And this is the second last slide, guys. But for me, you know, the, the pursuit of excellence really focuses on, on, on three key areas, really, around how you actually create an environment for people where they can learn. And that doesn't mean they're sitting in classrooms or anything. You can give, them, uh, give people the ability to stretch their capabilities and drive things forward for themselves and give them get, you know, get them engaged in what you're trying to do and their role to play within it and give them accountability. And there's no good uh, in hiring chess players and then treating them like chess pieces. So that was very much a piece that I, you know, I sort of um, personally believe in, but also draw as well in my time at Liverpool to say, right, you've got to give you give, give people the opportunity to grow. And because when you do that, people can actually do amazing things. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these things, but for me, I, I sort of try to articulate in this slide under four headings. What are the key things for me uh, that I believe are key to actually driving and delivering excellence? And they're under those banners there. I'm not going to read them out, guys. You can you can you can see them for yourselves. But it's all about collaboration. It's all about the culture. It's all about how you drive for continuous improvement and about executing things well with everybody understanding what their what their role is really to actually sort of get to where you're looking to get to. And that quote from the top player, I don't know if anybody knows Pat Riley, but he's a MBA coach, um, five probably regarded as the as the best MBA coach um, uh, ever. Won five MBA championships, four with the Lakers and one with the Miami Heat. Uh, but it just that just sort of sums up, you know, it's quite nicely what excellence is for me as well, is about that gradual result of always striving to do better. Uh, guys, um, Thanks for letting me ramble on for the last sort of, you know, 30, 30 or 40 minutes. I appreciate your time and hopefully you've got something from it. 
Great. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, very interesting to hear the different perspectives. So um, at this stage, what we want to do is we want to turn it over to you guys if you have any questions for Christian. So while you do that, uh, you can go ahead and type them in the in the chat box. Uh, Christian has spoken quite a bit uh, about how at his time at Liverpool Football Club, um, they delivered excellence. And it's been very interesting to hear from different perspectives. So go ahead uh, and ask your questions. We have a question here, um, Christian, from Scott Baxter, who says, you have overseen a lot of change projects. How have you gone about staffing these? Have external consultants been used? So that's a very good question from Scott. Uh, it is a good question, Scott. So uh, there's probably two sides to that. Uh, for big capital projects that we did, we did absolutely use um, external uh, support for that. And we, uh, we engaged uh, with uh, different organizations to help us with the project management of it, but also with, you know, as you can imagine, design and stuff like that there. But we did we did use a company, um, quite a large company that that helps with project management on some of our big projects, uh, and then uh, that's the same for other projects that we've done as well. Big ones that we think actually we need specific expertise on, or we would outsource that and, and get people brought in. But we would have it's interesting. We we would want them to come in and really understand how we operate as a club, because uh, it's different. I would say working in uh, in a in a, in a football club environment and that what was key to us was making sure that people understood what it was that we were who we are really and then within the club as well um we had we had a team you know a team of, of project uh project delivery managers if you like that expertise around process re-engineering um project delivery and business analysis so we had our own team and we'd, we would basically plan the resource based on the expertise of our team and when something was big enough to actually go outside and bring somebody in. Right, okay, excellent. Um, thanks for that question. Um, I, I have a question, Christian, and um, you know we are obviously very much involved in uh, training uh, leaders in the business side of sport and the business side of football, and uh, you've gone through one of our programs. So, you know, you've talked a lot about excellence and uh, some of the, you know, the different points that you have on screen here. So tell us how important it is for football clubs these days to have the, light, the right leaders and to have them prepared with the right knowledge, the right skills, and also, you know, the right, um, you know, yeah, the right leadership to be able to, um, to have this and implement this excellence off the pitch, as you've suggested. Uh, I, th I think it's absolutely vital uh, in terms of, of, of leaders. Um, of having the right leaders now I'll, I'll just talk about for shortly what why i believe you know, that's a very easy thing to say isn't it but i think leadership is is definitely needed in an environment particularly where football's out at the minute it's a football's a very very competitive environment you say well actually we know that it's competitive on the pitch but it's competitive in so many other ways as well because you're competing not only against other teams for fans but you're competing now in a completely different world of uh, time for individuals and what are they going to spend their time on in terms of you know new generations coming through. Uh, and so you know, talk about esports. Uh, there's different things happening. You know, obviously I don't, I don't, there may be some people on the on the on the on the uh, on this actually. I'm very well versed on it. But esports is going to be a you know it's going to be a big um, I think it's a big challenge for for football and other sports because obviously it, it, it's something that actually is competing for children's our children's time today, and I think that's going to be a key aspect for us. So you've got to be competitive to say, okay, what are we trying to do to actually not only create a great experience for people, but how can you engage with people that actually aren't the people that can come to Anfield every week, as an example, or the football stadium every week? I think the other thing on leadership as well is you've got to have clear leadership from the top and joint leadership from the top as well so that people understand where is what are we trying to achieve and where are we going to go and that there's not knee jerking happening um which i've seen happens a lot sometimes there's a lot of i've mentioned the word magpies you can't have a leadership structure where it's built on well actually we're going to knee jerk to something you've got to be core to actually what you believe in where you're trying to take the organization yes you'll have to sort of make adjustments along the way 
you can actually sort of have that sort of north star to where you're heading and have people believing in that that's really powerful right okay excellent thank you um we have another question here from bruno duarte and he he refers to you know he says that you talked about crisis management the crisis management program and uh, it was very interesting to hear about that <clears throat> especially in the times that we live in today of course that uh, you know we have to be very careful with um, the security and especially around the major you know international stars and events such as the players and the matches uh, with these types of football clubs but he says and goes on and talks about how does it work in terms of brand image protection so any thoughts on that um, Christian? yeah uh, that's a that's a good point that, um, uh, that the gentleman makes so yeah ab absolutely um, uh, brand brand image and protection is 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 a key a key aspect of this as well and so uh, absolutely all of our plans uh, are tied in with actually how we deal things how we communicate things but I think a lot people need to remember as well is that in lots of these situations you aren't really you aren't really in control of the incident or the communication of the incident um because uh, because uh, the world we live in uh people can be you know things can be communicated that actually uh, and people say things that aren't actually representing the club so there's very much a case of how we, you know there are, we've if you can imagine we've run exercises with, with different scenarios if this happened how would you actually do it and we've actually run them you know for full day sessions where we've had you know where different the people that would be in our teams you know that, that would deal with the crisis that would deal with the incident and our operational teams on the ground uh in different locations not connected to one another how do you communicate with it and how do you make sure um everybody's got the same information at the right time and how does that can get communicated outside the club um those are all sort of key things to be thinking about because um uh and again i suppose the other thing as well i've mentioned about you know that we have obviously we've got liberal football club we've also got liberal ladies and we've got liberal foundation and yes liberal ladies and liberal foundation are separate entities but if anything happens with them people just see liberal football club so uh i genuinely take my you know i've obviously been involved with you know the, how to manage all these type of things but you know the the comms team at, at, at liberal football club um and the, and the pr team are, are they are excellent you know, in terms of the skill set they've got with them um, ma managing everything that they manage okay good um there's another good question here coming in from jose baradin and um you know he says for a club with limited uh, with a limited budget what's the best way to start a process for looking for excellence without harming a few available resources um i i think uh it's about looking at uh what are the things that you know you've always got to do uh, within a football club and saying what are those things that we can actually doing those things but doing them better uh constantly trying to do them better all the time uh and that's the thing that I would wear at the start because a lot of the stuff doesn't have to be around uh, you know spending lots of money on uh on new systems or anything like that there it's about sort of making sure you, you know that you know are you confident even in a small football club that everybody is absolutely crystal clear what their role is and what they can be doing to actually uh enhancing whatever it is within their role is it is about enhancing the experience of the you know the fan is it about making sure that uh things are delivered in a certain way uh, and i think that the biggest thing is actually the one thing you'll have even a small club is actually getting um the attitude right and that's what i was saying earlier you know excellence is about attitude it's not necessarily a skill you shouldn't necessarily just go and buy that skill but you just need to be sure you've got passionate people that are really you know willing to go the extra mile and i you know, i've experienced it firsthand you know with within you know football club environments where you've got people that are uh, you know one of, one of our employees has been there 52 years <laughs> and uh she loves the place and she's, she's never going to leave the place but we've got other people like that that have been there years and uh you may some people may say that's a bad thing uh personally i think if you've got people that are that committed to the place you owe it to them to actually get them developed and to take it forward with them first so you know i would say you know invest invest in your people not necessarily in and in, in, in money or whatever but just in time and developing them and that's you know that's what i would start and look at the things you can actually make an impact on because uh, it doesn't need to be a lot of money spent right 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 yeah no absolutely absolutely 
Now, um, another question coming in here, and you know, we hear a lot about the business of football and football being like no other business, right? So what are some of the differences, some of the similarities you find, Christian, um, from the corporate world and the football world, you know, looking at it from a business standpoint, what are some of those, uh, you know, similarities and differences you find in, uh, you know, in working in, in the business side of football? I think in the in the main, um, there there aren't that there aren't that many differences really. I know it sounds it sounds really twee, but uh, what what I would say is that whenever you come into like a if you've not worked in sport before, the the best thing to do is just take your time to absorb everything and understand the way the culture works uh, within a football club. Um, that's the biggest thing because. Um, if you want to be successful from from um, stepping from a, a non-sport business, if you like, into a, into sport, I think you've really got to understand exactly what makes an organisation tick. And my biggest, you know, the, the other thing I'd say as well is you, you need you do need resilience. Um, and I've seen, you know, even in my time at Liverpool, um, people come in and think and they can change the world and. And in reality, you know, they come with the best of intentions, but they really got to understand, you know, how things operate. And that's really no different to any other organization. But I do think within, you know, the football club, um, you've got to you've got to really sort of really understand it a lot more and take more time to understand it. Um, and remember that when, when all said and done, we are here to win football matches. We're a football club. You know, we're here to win football matches and win trophies. And always have that at, at the front of your mind. So when you're thinking about other things that you think can can happen, always remember that actually that's the most important thing. And if you focus on that and focus on well, what are the things that I can do to actually make things easier for um, people within the club to do it, um, drive a bit of drive a bit of value for the club, um, or actually sort of make things actually just you know, a better a better for the fans. That you know that's what I said to my presentation. That's the thing to focus on. But I, you know, I, I appreciate there may be some people that are on, not here tonight that are actually asking, well, how did how did I make the leap from football or from where I was into football? And I think, uh, yes, I was contacted, so there was probably a bit of good fortune in that. And I, 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 but I would say that if you want to get involved in sport, I think you've got to think about, you know, how you position yourself and uh, how you, you know, you've got to be persistent. And then you've got to think about your presence. And what do I mean by that? Presence really around, okay, how are you sort of setting yourself up for, so that people actually know who you are, what you're going to be standing for, and what you can actually offer? And there are loads of people that will give you some of their time, you know, at, you know, in all walks of life, if you just go and ask them. Um, so, and some people you might think, actually, I won't get any time with that individual, so I'm not going to bother. My advice would be, there's no, no harm in, in dropping a note through LinkedIn or you know, getting in contact with someone, just saying, you know, can I, can I have half an hour of your time over a coffee? Uh, people will give that. You know, most people will, you know, will, will look to give that. But, you know, there's some people obviously won't, but most people, I think, in the main would give that, give you, give people some time just to think about how they can, how they can do that. But um, be persistent and be resilient. That's what I would say. Yeah, good points. Good points. Um, maybe we'll take the last question here, which is sort of a segue with. Uh, what we want to um, talk about in just a moment about our, our program. And, uh, you know, Scott asks, uh, he says, in terms of personal development, uh, and, and I think you already answered, but he says, did you at any point specifically plan your career to become an operations executive in football? But perhaps the second part of this question is one where we could, uh, you know, talk about. It. And he says, how have you balanced your work commitments and attaining numerous qualifications? And I know. You know, you've mentioned, of course, that you've done uh, programs with VSI, uh, you've done programs with SBI, and uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how you've managed that and how you've been able to attain these qualifications while you've, um, you know, had a very, um, you know, high, high demanding position. Yeah, I think the very first part of your question, I, I, I genuinely think it is good to have a plan, have a career plan about what are you, where are you trying to get to. It doesn't have to be working for a specific organization, but what what type of what would be your what would what's, I suppose what's your ideal job and, and and what are the sort of attributes you think you need to have for that type of role? Uh, to answer the second part of the question, um, you know, touching on um, uh, what I've done with uh, 
the master's um, in sport and directorship. So to give you an idea, that, that's about 16 days commitment over a year. Uh, you get together every six weeks with you know, with your, you know, your colleagues um, and it's for a two day section. Now, I was fortunate uh, in the fact that um, Liverpool uh, gave me the days to do that uh, as well. So, so I didn't have to take holidays. Um, and um, uh, you know, so that, that 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 helped a lot with my time. Uh, but in in and in, uh, in the May and the, the the coursework that you get, there are a number of different. You probably have about three to four pieces of coursework you've got to do every year, but they're not overly demanding. And I think you can definitely fit time in to do that. Uh, I'd say that myself in terms of like time at the weekend because I have a family. Um, so there are there are things you, if you want to do it, you'll make the time to do it. I suppose is the best way of saying it. And um. And I would say, you know, from my first year on 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 the on the master's program, it's it's the big thing. The big thing that I've really benefited from is actually the whole the, the networking side of it and getting you know finding the network side of it, but also the interesting, you know, as well as the main core program, we have guest speakers that come and deliver different things, and that's been uh, really enjoyable. Uh, my my program, I've got a lot. Of, there's people that are from the world of sport, as in there's athletes. Um, as well as people from uh, not not involved in sport whatsoever, and then so I suppose people like me involved in the business of sport. So that's been enjoyable. In terms of the the, the digital transformation course um, that I did, um, that was I think that was the first time I'm right, Diego. That's the first time it's been done, um, and uh, yes. it was great. It was really good. You know, uh, Stephen, um, who basically developed the course. Uh, I think to be fair, has done a great job with that, and we basically have we did it for four months. Every month, it was every Monday night for effectively an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes, similar format to what you've got now. Uh, the speakers were great; it was really informative. Uh, if you missed one, it was not a problem. You could actually because they recorded. You can actually go into the Caroline campus and do it yourself and get that information. And then you, you worked in teams towards the end of it to create a presentation based on three or four different topics that were provided by Sports Business Institute. But again, I think the other side of that is around the network because we finished uh, back in May, but we're still in contact with another, still sending stuff, each you know information through WhatsApp groups and all the rest of it. So uh, I'd recommend you know uh, I'd recommend both of them really. You know, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed both of them and. Um, the sporting directorship one in particular really was around me building my knowledge within sport uh, uh, to you know take the next step uh, where it may take me, uh, um, whether it becoming a sporting director or something else. Really, you know, I don't, I don't think people should think of it as well. I do this course and suddenly I'm going to become a sporting director. Um, it's about actually sort of uh, building your knowledge, uh, building your profile, um, and uh, networking. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why together with VSI, we've joined forces to create the Certificate in Football Business Management, um, which, like I mentioned at the outset, it's an eight-month program. It begins in October and it finishes in, in uh, June. Christian is going to be one of the speakers. So, uh, you know, what we've aimed for tonight is for you to get a taste of how football executives come, deliver their knowledge, they talk about their day-to-day -day job. They provide insights as to how things are run from within. And that's a whole objective that throughout eight months, you're continuously getting access to some of the top executives, no matter where you are in the world, whether you're connecting from you know, Europe or Latin America or Asia, everybody can come together and learn and create um, you know, a really strong cohort, which is what we've had with all the programs that we've run together um, with VSI. Uh, as I mentioned, it starts October 22nd. It has a duration of eight months. It's all in English. And we also have some events in Barcelona. At the end of the course, we have a graduation dinner and a two-day corporate tour in Barcelona where we take you to see the top football clubs and organizations from within here in the city. So we take you to FC Barcelona and you speak with some executives at the club, at Espanol, um, Media Pro, be in sports, etc. So you have an opportunity to spend two days at the end of the program and uh, network and collaborate with um, the rest of the participants that you will have engaged throughout the eight months. We also provide the opportunity for those that sign up to attend the World Football Summit in Madrid, which is held on September 24th and 25th. These are some of the, you know, on screen you have some of the points that the program includes. 
I'll just run through some of the quick, um, you know, uh, main ones. But one of one of the ones that we really want to deliver is the networking element. Mm -hmm. So we've provided all the candidates that uh, take part in this program uh, an opportunity to attend the World Football Summit, which is uh, co-hosted by La Liga. So you have an opportunity to meet all the different executives from La Liga at this conference. In fact, from the, the global network of La Liga that work all over the world. And uh, you have an opportunity to attend. There's also an opportunity to attend the Sporting Directors Summit on September 11 in Manchester, which is run by um, VSI. There's opportunities to do internships. There's a personalized mentorship and career development plan. And this is important because it touches upon what Christian was saying. You know, we take you on uh, for this program and we find out where you are at today. But more importantly, we, we study and we analyze with you your objectives, your aspirations to see where you want to be at the end of the course. And all throughout, we look to fill those gaps that you may need to develop, whether it is improving your network, whether it is improving a specific skill set in a particular area of the football industry. And each individual is different. You know, there, there's people that come from different parts of the world with different backgrounds, different ages, different aspirations. So it's important for us to understand each individual. And by doing so, we can then cater to their aspirations and tailor, um, you know, tailor make a program uh, that is delivering uh, mentorship and it's career delivering career guidance specific to each candidate. So it's not, it's not a program that is transactional. And Christian mentioned this uh, with the courses that he's done at BSI and, and with us at SBI. You know, we really take our candidates on board because we want to see you succeed. Because at the end of the day, our success depends on your success, and uh, we have that very clear in our, you know, in our mission and our objective. So, that said, if you are interested, the course begins on on October twenty second. We're getting a lot of uh, applications. There's a high demand for this program. So, if you are interested, um, let us know and get in touch with us. I'll put our contact information here. You can contact myself. Uh, there's our our information there. You can contact Tony Tony Faulkner from VSI. There's his information there as well if you're interested in, in this program. And like I said, we're going to be bringing top guest speakers such as Christian who have uh, you know, a wealth of experience uh, as he has uh, having worked in the industry for um, a number of years. And also we complement with additional uh, speakers from the business side of football. So that's essentially what I wanted to communicate uh, tonight. Um, at this stage, I'll just simply say thank you once again to Christian. Christian, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to, to be with you tonight, to listen to your insights, to have you share all of the different um, you know, initiatives that you were working for um, while at LFC. And uh, we, we uh, look forward to having you as our guest lecturer for this program. And of course, we'll be um, very keen to to keep in touch with you moving forward. So that said, uh, yes, I just want to thank you once again, uh, Christian, for your time tonight. Thank you, and th thank you for everybody's attendance and their time this evening as well. Excellent, and to all of you tonight who have uh, signed on, thank you very much, as always, for taking the time for uh, being with us for this webinar. Uh, we look forward to connecting with you. You know we have a strong community. The VSI, SBI community is uh, very strong online, so connect with us. Get in touch with us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and of course, uh, the traditional way email is always available. So that said, have an, act, uh, an excellent um, evening, uh, afternoon, or morning, wherever you're connecting from. And of course, be sure to enjoy the World Cup uh, final this weekend. Uh, all the best, everybody, and look forward to connecting soon. Bye for now. Bye.